wanted to first really thank you for coming here. It's a Friday night. I know that this is not the usual time that uh, you guys attend to events. But also, these guys have been coming over for 15 Saturdays in a row. So we thought that Friday was slightly better than, than Saturday, right? And the idea is basically to cover a lot of topics and explain a bit what I thought it is about. But the most important thing is that we showcase uh, the projects, the fellows who show the projects that they've been able to build over 12 weeks of, of iteration and where most of them had no idea of AI to begin with. So I definitely encourage you, if you're a beginner in AI, um, to just get started. There's, there's plenty of resources out there. We'll, we'll give you some quotes. Join us. Go to whatever is online, Coursera, and G. And yeah, this is uh, hopefully uh, uh, a good step forward. So one of the first questions that people ask us is, why do we do this? And the underlying idea of how we began AI Saturdays is that there's a paradigm in the future of work that's coming over. AI is scalable, it happens on a very short time frame, and it leads to a concentration of power. So we think that this is gonna have a high impact on the jobs. And one of the biggest problems is that there's not enough AI professionals to fulfill um, the demands from companies who wanna implement those technologies. So AI Saturdays was basically born with the idea that we could train those AI professionals from a diverse background um, anywhere in the world with resources that are already available online. And why do we do this, you may ask? It's because if you were born in San Francisco, uh, Barcelona or London, it's very likely that you will have a good access to resources and quality of life. But actually, if we think about AI, one of the biggest problems is the bias. Um, so if we're able to train professionals anywhere in the world in a decentralized manner, um, this will just enhance the quality of the products that we're able to produce and ensure that we make it more fair for everyone out there. Um, basically, AI Saturdays began sort of as a pet project. Uh, there was a friend of mine, Gia, he was in Singapore. Um, he was starting his company on uh, solving the problem of reproducibility on AI research. Uh, because AI papers cannot be tested and verified as other science uh, can do uh, because it's, there's too many papers produced and companies are not currently uh, showing the code of what they're doing. And basically he created this community. Um, I was on the point of saying, okay, maybe I should join, maybe I should do AI. And I said, okay, I'll do it in Barcelona. We put it on a, on a Facebook group and it went viral. People started applying to be ambassadors everywhere in the world and it's right now in more than 150 cities. In one year, there's 5,000 members, and we're in every single continent except Antarctica. So one of the first things you say is, if you do know someone in Antarctica, please let us know so that they can open the hub there, and we can say that we're worldwide. And one of the things that people are very surprised about AI Saturdays is the way we work, because we don't teach things, you know? The way you guys normally operate in university, or at least from our perspective was that they would give us lessons and then would have to do homework and then the lessons had nothing to do with the homework or it was very easy for the teacher, it was very hard for us, right? One of the things that we do here is whoever has to learn AI is you and whoever has to code it is you. And also, it is very, very unlikely that we can get a professor in Barcelona that can teach you better than Andrew NG from Stanford or the founder of Kaggle that are already online. So basically what we do is we meet together in a co-working space, we watch the videos, um, we do a, like a review in the morning, but then everyone can watch them at their own pace, and then we do the exercises, and we help each other. And one of the most interesting things about AI Saturdays is that because we're synced with the other cities, um, not only you have a problem, but the guy from Madrid has a problem, so you're able to solve it together at the same time frame. So it's like, I, I don't know if you've ever done an online course, but one of the biggest problems of online courses is that there's a moment where you get stuck, you know, and it's Saturday night, nobody's gonna help you out, and you wait three days for an answer, and then you kind of lose interest because real life <laughs> takes over. So what we're trying to do here is basically save a time gap for you where you work on AI, which, hey, is Saturdays, because we figured out that you guys would run out of excuses for uh, the weekend on Sunday was very rough, and also, there's people doing that very same thing right now. So if you have a problem, it gets solved on the spot. And 
One of the coolest things about learning in a group is that not only do you learn, you also develop relationships, you develop projects, and those things build up and build on. And it's about the community that we create and how people help each other. We like to say that the biggest power of AI Saturdays is not us or the quality of our teaching, because the teaching, like I said, is non-existent, but it's basically about you guys and how you make the community and how you decide to move forward. And hopefully, through the projects that you will see today, um, that can be verified. Um, just to give you a bit overview of how a normal Saturday works, is uh, we begin at 9.30 in the morning, we cover one video of theory, then we do a tiny coffee break because, hey, we know it's Saturday and you guys um, may need some additional drugs in your veins, the healthy ones. And then we do practice and projects. Uh, the first weeks, the first 10 weeks we do practice, and the last four we do a project uh, that leads up to five. And there's different levels. One of the coolest things about AI Saturdays is that you can join in as a complete beginner and you will have assurance that because there's an expert, any kind of problem that you have with, let's say, Matplotlib or NumPy, which are Python libraries, will get solved in that session. And at the very same time, if you're an expert, let's say you're an experienced developer and you want to get into AI, it's going to be fairly easy for you, but there's going to be people that are going to be constantly asking you questions and challenging you on that. And also, we t we're, gonna try, we're really trying to get people from different fields. So if you are a, an expert developer, yes, your neural network will look good. But if you're able to partner up with a biotechnologist, uh, he or she will explain you why it's important um, to do epigenomics and why that could be a good application for artificial intelligence. So one of the coolest things that we're trying to do is basically to get a diversity of fields to understand that AI is just a tool. It's a really powerful tool, just like the internet was, and that essentially the ones that learn it and apply it in a fair social way are gonna have a head start. So one of the requirements that we also have for AI Saturdays, because it's a nonprofit project, is that all of your code is open source and uh, that you do something that creates a positive impact. We don't want you to design the next uh, weaponized AI uh, army, which hopefully none of you will do over uh, the Saturday, but still, uh, the underlying idea is that we use this power to make the world a better place. And we also are very open with our data. Um, basically, uh, one of the biggest problems that we're trying to solve is getting more females um, into the landscape. You can see that this is even a problem for us, so one of the ideas that we launch is to do diversity scholarships um, for people from very diverse backgrounds uh, so they can join in and be part of this community because we feel that this is the fundamental way that we're gonna solve one of these issues. And also, people are super committed. But high commitment doesn't necessarily mean high knowledge. If you don't have high knowledge on Python, it's okay. You can learn with us. We're, we're not gonna say, if you don't know Python, we definitely, rec this is not the course for you because you should do Python uh, on your own and then come over so you can do that in your own networks. But when people began, at least their self-assessment of their own knowledge was not uh, high enough. And I can also validate that through my own journey that I'll try to tell you later. And also one of the coolest things that we see uh, in this trend is that people are really seeking a career change or to create impact projects. And this is one of the coolest stuff because it leads to collaboration and just basically going beyond that Saturday. I'm not gonna lie to you, if you spend f four hours for 15 Saturdays in a row, that will lead you to some knowledge on AI, but it won't take you to where you need to be to get hired or to launch your own startup. You need to create uh, your own time gap so that you can create that phase on a week to week basis. And that's only done if you have a high motivation for it. So either you want a new career, you want to do a specific project, you think that it's a very interesting field, so you want to get a head start, and this is why people come around here. And last but not least, this could not be possible with any of these sponsors of the film slide, especially Alpha and Vistaprint that are over here, and we'll give you an overview of what they do. Um, so I'll very quickly try to cover what the other sponsors do, just so that you have a knowledge um, of the things that are accessible to you, of companies that are collaborating, and they're actively helping people um, change their professional field. So uh, Nurture.ai 
is the research that Gia, the founder of ASR Days, began. It's basically allowing students and AI practitioners to review machine learning papers. I don't know if you know the way uh, paper revision works, but normally you have to be a PhD, you have to be a reputation in that field to review a paper. The idea here is that we do like a batch classifier. We have um, the people that are the students and the machine learning professionals reviewing it, and then because there's not enough number of people to select which papers are relevant for the professionals, with this we get a filter, the students learn, they get referrals for, um, for their projects, for their applications, and then we can essentially filter out the nice candidates. Just to give you an idea of how crazy this problem is, there is one conference, I think, in Canada, uh, it's NIPS, uh, it's one of the most famous conferences on AI, I think the total number of submitted papers was 10,000. So imagine if you are a professor or a reviewer that has to review 10,000 papers, it's completely undoable, and, and if at the end they end up selecting 100, you basically have the same amount of odds of getting in that are going to Harvard. So it's highly, highly selective. Um, also, uh, Orbito is a platform um, where they have the computer on the cloud. It's not about your drive. It's not about your Dropbox. It's basically about having your work, everything on the cloud, and they give 25 euros free for, for the sign-up. It's a really, really ambitious company based in Spain. Um, Depot Lab is a co-working venue that they have kindly helped us um, host the 12 Saturdays in a row. And they also are providing specific pricing for people that want to start their own startup. And the Video Inception program is just a program that allows you um, to get better GPU access and discounts if you want to get deeper into machine learning besides training. And I'm going to give the floor to Theodore that's going to tell you a bit more about what Mr. Print does and why it is also important for them. Us. Not much stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, so I want to start with a story. Imagine you have a small startup in Barcelona. It's not necessarily a tech startup. Maybe you have a um, food catering service or something like that. And you want to print a flyer. Doesn't look like a big deal. But if you look at it, it looks decent. Seems quality. Right? Well, you want to print maybe 100 of this. Um, McDonald's is going to print 10 million. For them to print one is going to be very cheap. For you, because it's custom, it's your design, it's going to be expensive, right? Makes sense. So what we're doing, we're enabling small companies to print at nearly the same cost as the large ones. It's called mass customization. And how we do that is with our own in-house technology. So we have things like uh, printers and software for printers that are built in-house and not buying for HP, we're not going to other places. It's our own patents and this allows us to come up with very low prices. And you might think, okay, maybe is this a big business? <laughs> doesn't, doesn't sound like a huge uh, business, but now in 20 years we become a uh, $3.7 billion company, I think. Lately we have um, around 8,000 employees worldwide. Um, we have a factory in Europe, we have two in the US, we have a smaller one in Japan. You can buy from us worldwide, we are market leaders in this segment. And um, pretty much it's uh, quite nice. I also like to think of us, uh, if you think, we do have a prototype physical store, but all our business is done online. So we have um, a traditional e-commerce website and that brings you clients well, to put the orders, but the entire ecosystem that lives behind it and rivals maybe any other e-commerce that you can find out there. So you can expect to find with us the same things that you would find in Amazon. You know, when you get that customer who bought this, also bought something else. That's something that's done usually with AI or machine learning or something like that. We are trying to do the same thing. We're trying to determine um, who are your important customers? How can you build a profile for them and how can you help them be successful? So for instance, if you know somebody has a small um, picnic 
catering. Um, other people who have a picnic catering can benefit from something that's been successful for this um, We are, um, we have our headquarters in Boston. We have around uh, 250 developers there. And there are around 50 in uh, Barcelona, another 40 going to 50 in Prague. And what we do in Barcelona, it's a digital marketing. In paid search, we are one of the top 10 customers of Google. We're building our own in-house tools for uh, paid search. Again, using uh, some sort of machine learning and a lot of data for that. And we're looking for more people to join us in, in this area. And with that, I think I'll cut my speaking slot here and give the opportunity to... Yeah. Similar to what uh, they want. Any other questions? No. I'll give the, the floor to Alex, but he told me he wanted to try something different. So I'll give the corporate presentation of Alpha and he'll, he'll give you um, some presentation that he's been working on uh, with the past. So if you don't know about Alpha, it's the really the second moonshot factory in the world. The first one is X also formerly known as Google X, where Waymo began. Um, what they are doing here in Barcelona is they're focusing on moonshots, which is this sort of like long-term thinking that can change the humanity in 15 years. So they basically have their own spin-off from Telefonica, and they're focusing on the key issues, like for example, chronic disease in health. Um, how can we bring energy to essentially a part of the population that hasn't had access to the second industrial revolution? and also on education, if I'm not mistaken. So they're a really, really bold company with bold ideas, but one of the, I think one of the most differentiating traits that they have is that they're gonna do that on an ethical way. So they're not willing to go through all of that shortcuts that Facebook, Google, or the other companies have been through, and that's why they're under fire or why your data is being sold to better target you when you're pregnant, and so on and so forth. So I'd say, it's a really, really bold bet. Um, they're really looking for people that are proficient in the field. But if you're passionate about solving those issues, it's really worth it. And they're here in Barcelona, which is something that I think we should all bet upon. Um, OK, uh, so I, I, I'll give you the second corporate pitch without being from Alpha. Um, basically, on their moonshots, uh, on education, uh, sorry, on health, um, they basically identified that is, I think is one of the biggest insights that I got from, from their presentation is that there is five things that are killing 70% of the population which are chronic diseases. They're all cancer, they're diabetes. It's not, it's not about going to war, it's not about all the things that you read in the news, it's basically about your day-to-day -day behavior. So basically, if you could quit smoking, if you could quit not doing exercise, if you could start sleeping well, if you could start eating well, you would solve 75% of those issues. So I think it's a really key factor. And when we think about living long term, most of us are concerned about if they're gonna send us a bomb here or there. It's likely that we're gonna kill ourselves with McDonald's fries. So just think about it. And they're also thinking about ways that they can help you um, activate those behaviors to be more healthy and live longer. So right. there you go, Alex. Mm -hmm. Um, it really seems like you, you studied our value proposition a lot. Are you looking for a job? Yeah, maybe. Send me over to So, the, hi everyone. I've seen like 40% of you a bunch of times already, which is weird. And it's cool because most of the people in Barcelona are actually doing something, are all here. Um, this is going to be quite unorthodox because my fault, not John's, don't worry, but technical problems and all this stuff and also it's weird that Vistaprint hasn't adapted any Mac to HDMI technology yet, so one of those as well. But I, uh, I've been working on something for a while. Um, I'm not going to talk about Alpha. You did a tremendous job, and we only really have 10 minutes to talk. Um, but I've, developing, I've been developing this theory and kind of co-writing a paper with some people at work. Um, and we're talking a lot about 
as if we live in a simulation, right? This is like a really big question that a lot of people are asking themselves. Um, and I do have a like 45 minute long presentation, which is, I guess, quite cool to my standards, but that's obviously not gonna happen here. So we're gonna have a conversation, maybe, right? I'm gonna ask, or I'm gonna tell you the questions that I ask myself, and you guys have gotten pretty much into this world, and I'm sure that you have something interesting that you might or might not have thought of within this realm, right? But um, the question really is, is if we live in a simulation, how would we know? There's really very few ways to do this. Um, why would we be in a simulation? Would it work? Are we simulated by other humans in the future? Are we simulated by aliens? Are we some sort of self, thank you for this deep dream right here. <laughs> Are we some sort of self-created kind of simulation in a sense, but it's quite interesting because if you check, I have all the numbers, I'm gonna, just gonna go all over it because I don't remember it exactly, but if you check, the fastest or the most powerful supercomputer is called, in the world right now, is called X, I don't remember, um, and it has X amount of flops, teraflops, I don't really remember this, but the whole point of it is that if you assume Moore's law and kind of the growth of how many teraflops we've been gaining for 10 years over the last, I don't know, 30 years in computing, in about 80 years or so, we'd be able to simulate all the processes of about all humanity and all kind of neural connections or blasting of the synapses with one computer. And so when I did this calculation and then I kind of went into more data and found more, it was only 80 years until we could simulate one second of all humanity, of every single thought in humanity. In 80 years, we can simulate every single thought that every single human has had. And it made me think, I mean, do we live in this simulation? So since we don't have that much time, I wanted to kind of talk about it with you guys. What do you think? Have you ever thought about something like this? Since the Matrix. Yeah, and, and uh, honestly, the matrix is one of the things that made me think about it as well. The question is, have we been placed there or not? And is it easy to create these artificial worlds? Is there somebody or something that's trying to fool us? Is this all created on purpose? Or is it kind of created randomly, right? I assume you guys have heard of like these procedural algorithms. Um, have you ever heard of the game No Man's Sky? Okay, so it's, it's a really cool game, but the whole idea is that it's based on procedural algorithms. So somebody did all the math in the beginning, and you can fly around onto any planet in this video game, and as you land instantly, every single variable of it gets created. The atmosphere, the color, the temperature, the animals, the houses, absolutely every single thing on there from zero to one gets created in a complete random or procedural algorithm fashion. So it could be that stuff is being created as we walk in. And then I wonder, well, what's happening? Are things being generated just within my field of view? As in, am I walking into a room and that room is being generated? Or as I'm on Earth, is the entire planet being generated at the same time? But it makes me think different things. Like, you know, when I'm walking through Plaza Catalunya and I see thousands of people, right? And you're walking on one side and then you look over onto the other side and there's some random person that you really haven't seen, but they're in the back of your kind of like peripheral vision. And I wonder to myself, like, are they real? Are they just like background shit code that's kind of just running and that's not doing anything? Is that just made to create the illusion of something? But then it's almost like something very weird, right? It's like quantum physics in a sense. It's like the collapsing of the wave function of probability, as they call it because that person is not going to be a person until all of a sudden I walk all the way over to the end of Plaza Catalunya and I say, hey, what's up? And then that person is obviously gonna stop being this background shit code and going to interact with me. And then all of a sudden that person has a story, has a life, has kids or not, goes to school, has money or not, and just came from McDonald's. But until I walked over to the other side, that person was nobody. There were nothing, they didn't have a name, they had nothing, they were just background code running in the back of what I believe to be the simulation that is my universe. So then I wonder, are you real? 
or am I real to you? Are you all part of a collective hallucination where you're seeing me and then you can all talk to each other about me? Or as an objective observation, are we all part of his memory right there in his simulation? And are you not real? But then you look upon yourself and you realize, well, I'm conscious, I have consciousness, I know myself, I know what I did this morning, and I know I had a breakfast. But in essence, you are part of his simulation and his mind, but you're observing yourself and seeing consciousness. So it's almost like this idea of fractals, I don't know if you've ever seen it, right? Like if you look at a cauliflower and you see it from the outside, and then you zoom in with a microscope, it looks almost the same. Yes? I have a question. Go ahead. So, I've heard this theory, some more or less version of it before. If it's my reality and everybody's a simulation and a running of shit code, why is so much programming energy and detail invested in something that's not real? Why am I the only person who has consciousness in this world and everybody else has so much detail in them, but they're actually not anything at all? Why put so much effort into that? Why put so much effort to fool you? Yeah, is what you mean. In this theory, why so, put, put so much by, by the way, more? first of all, I don't know if we live in a simulation or not. I mean, I'm not saying I think this. This is just a thought experiment. And I mean, I wish we had more time and I had my slides because I would go into the actual science and computing of it, which we're not. We're just bullshitting right now. But I mean, that right there is assuming that somebody's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Somebody's trying to fool you, right? And so. Why could that be? I mean, could it be aliens? Maybe. Could it be like in the Matrix? Robots trying to harvest your energy? I mean, I don't know. But it's also interesting to think that if I said before that in 80 years our supercomputers will be able to simulate all of human history, and in a world of ever-growing shortage of oxygen, materials, food, everything, what if in the humans of 80 years realize, well, the most efficient way to keep our population is to keep them locked up in some sort of simulation, right? Because when you're still, you consume less oxygen, you eat less food, and you just consume less in general. Is this happening? I mean, there's no real reason, and I don't have the answer of this at all, but these are questions that we always all ask each other, and I guess the interesting ultimate thing of everything is that we're never going to know. There's absolutely no way to know. Because even if there was a glitch in the code, there's some sort of glitch in the matrix if there was a creator, why wouldn't they be able to go back and correct that? Why wouldn't they be able to erase our memory? Assuming that there is a third kind of person that's controlling us. But it's also quite possible that we're all this idea of Boltzmann brains, right? Which was, Boltzmann was a physicist. And he said that it's more likely, statistically, that we all because of the random jiggling of molecules in the universe, that our brains statistically came together as the mashup of different interstellar particles and created consciousness for each one of us than that we arose from evolution. Meaning that it's more likely that we just happen to have consciousness out of nothing because of the random rearrangement of molecules than that evolution occurred. This is a really crazy theory, and we could go on for ages, but. I already see that John is encroaching. And obviously, I could go on for decades. I'm happy to talk about this more with you guys, but um, I'm excited to see your work. Thank you very much. I'll leave it with that, because I've only read the Nick Wallstrom book. But if I would say something, one of the most interesting thoughts from that book is essentially, if there has ever been another kind of civilization like ours, that has lived through the same amount of years, either there's been a point where they have become extinct, and therefore we may become extinct too, and that's just what's coming to us, or they've been able to simulate that, and then we're a byproduct of their simulation. Um, so it's an interesting thought experiment, but at the end I think it doesn't change. You know, like If you're in a game, if you're in Matrix, your goal is to break it. So I would still encourage you to do the best you can um, to break out of this net in which you're currently in. Or maybe not, just go completely crazy, but I wouldn't recommend it because you don't get a second try. So what I wanted to cover in this uh, second talk is basically why we believe that diversity is the thing that is more important 
for the future of AI landscape right now. And also basically to highlight um, one of the main opportunities of artificial intelligence um, when it comes to the future. Some of you have already seen this talk because I gave it um, uh, two weeks ago on Ada for Good and I'm also gonna be giving it on a TEDx, a slightly improved version. But I wanna basically share this with you um, and also see if you agree or not or if you have a different view. And again, this is um, to give a support point to the argument by Alex, which is our computational power is ever increasing to the point where we are going to be able to simulate every single synapse and connection in our brain in a future scenario, which we think that if the laws continue to grow and so on, we'll, we'll get to that point. But where that gets us, um, I think, is that one of the most common thoughts about people that don't believe that artificial intelligence is going to have a big change of their lives is, okay, we've lived through three previous industrial revolutions before. Why should this one be different? And to that people I say, so first of all, if you look at the scale at which those are, uh, industrial revolutions happened, um, the first industrial revolution was about more than 150 years, the second industrial revolution um, was also more than 100 uh, years, and the third one, uh, we can say at least 50 years. And if we think about it, from the first industrial revolution, the fields became completely extinct. From the second industrial revolution, we used to have cars, people used to work on, on the field, they went to the factories, they work massively there. So there has really been change. It has just been over a large period of time. So one of the biggest problems of artificial intelligence or opportunities, if you see it that way, is that the time frame where it happens is so so fast. I do you remember like Uber didn't exist um, ten years ago. We guys, not now because they are forbidding it in the city hall of Barcelona, but we think about it as as a as a fundamental thing, you know. Everybody should have a right to Airbnb. That will be maybe written on the 2050 laws. Um, it's like, one of the, when this change happens, we adopt it so fast because we don't wanna go back to what we previously had. We don't wanna have less, let's say, what Google gives you for the recommendations on how to go from A to B with Google Maps, that's done partially with artificial intelligence. And, you know, I wanna get faster to my place, so we're not gonna stop using that technology. It's already out there. One of the biggest factors as well is the concentration of wealth. If you design an algorithm, you get to keep all the property of it. Other ones are just exploiting, exploiting it. And I think this is gonna have huge implications um, for the future of work, basically because it's gonna shift the way work is distributed and even possibly the value that we place to work. If you think about it now, how you are considered a useless, a useless or useful byproduct of society is on your production ability, not on your happiness ability, not on your knowledge ability, on your production ability. And very few years from now, robots are gonna be able to beat us on that production ability. So it's probably likely that we're gonna have to change. And also one of the most important things is that we think that we're all through the third industrial revolution. There's people that don't even have access to electricity. One billion people, that's one seventh of the world's population. Another bigger chunk doesn't have proper internet. We here are so privileged because we live under the assumption uh, that when 100 megabytes per second drops, we can just change providers, and that's, that's the biggest of our problems. But uh, I really want to forecast this, that AI is an advantage for leapfrogging. If you think about Africa, they don't have internet. So what, how they've managed to deploy uh, payments and banking system is through SMS. If you think about China, they have a huge problem with corruption and currency and the exploitation of their currency, and they want to track their citizens. So how they've basically done it is right now in China, you cannot pay in cash. Like you can try, they're gonna accept it, but I can tell you a story where I landed in Shanghai airport in four in the morning, there was no bank, nobody wanted to give me any money, and the, the only way that I managed to get a train um, to the central station was to give a whole, a whole bar of Jamon Serrano to a person so that they would pay me with their ticket, right? And this is uh, scary at least because if they can see everything that you're paying and everything that you're doing, if a government is willing to give that data to companies, they can exploit um, however your behavioral patterns. In China, if you go on the speed train, there's a message, there's a very calm message that says, please behave correctly, do not litter smoke on the train. If you do so, social points will be deducted from your currency system. And if you have your social points deducted, you cannot get out of the country, you cannot travel in first class, you cannot get the speed train, so on and so forth. So I think 
we're already seeing the opportunities for the uh, countries and uh, generations that are behind, but also the problems that this can bring upon us. And basically, um, I think the biggest questions that we have ourselves is, that we have to ask ourselves is, how can we use it um, for a positive manner and a positive change? And when we think about positive change, I think there's really two areas. There's the first one that, say, alpha or ethic companies are working on, which is, how can we establish a boundary between good AI and bad AI? You know, for example, if you have Amazon's um, hiring pattern um, that has a bias against women, that's bad AI, then they have to shut it down. If we have an AI that's able to detect the people that are legally deforesting the Amazon, that's potentially being used for good. And I would say um, there, people are really pushing towards establishing a boundary, a code of ethics, a limit, a red, red line if you want to say it, of how we can use AI. But this is a really, really complex problem for one of uh, the theories, the game theory developed by Joe Nash, which is basically, it's a prisoner's dilemma. If one country doesn't do that and the other one does it, they gain a competitive advantage. So therefore, they can place themselves ahead. Same thing goes for companies. So it's very hard to push for these kind of behaviors in a world where you think that everybody is competing against you behind your back. And the other thing is diversity. I think I break it down to five different types of diversity, where the first one, I think, is also um, the problem where we say uh, there's a very common phrase, which is the bias. No, the, the algorithms have bias. And if you think about AI and you think about the neural network, it's what they're trained to do. They're trained to have bias. There's literally a bias layer. But that's because that's the way they behave. The problem that we have is that there's bias in the models that we feed them. If the data set of CEOs is only made of males, they will learn that CEOs are automatically male. The problem that we have to fix is that we have to make that data set balanced. So I think it's about us, it's about the people that form this space that can really significantly change how this is changed. Because if you, if you are, if, let's say for example, here there's not um, someone uh, from let's say uh, Nigeria, right? But if you put uh, their local food and their nothing, if, if they were working on Google, and when you put food, they didn't see their representation there, they would complain. Here, we don't complain because we're more or less from the same kind of background. So we don't see this problem happening. So we need to bring this diversity on. And I think it's about also accessibility. If we think about technology, let's think about VR, augmented reality. It's being designed for us, for the masses. It's not being designed for someone that is blind, someone that is on a wheelchair, someone that has a specific set of problems. That's incrementing the gap that they have with technology. So we have to make sure that the way we use it brings them closer to where we are, instead of uh, creating a bigger and bigger divide and an us versus them problem. For example, with self-driving cars, if you fire half of the truck drivers in the US, they're gonna get really mad. In here, you have a perfect example. Taxis don't wanna be replaced. They've given a shitty service for 30 years. They've I would say profited from the increase, the irrational increase in the pricing of the licenses. And when a new competitor has come up, they're willing to destroy cars um, just for the sake of getting their way. Well, it turns out that we're now gonna create an artificial market to protect them. But the reality is that someday that bubble will burst and uh, taxi drivers are gonna have to compete hand to hand with Uber or whatever technology is next. And that's gonna be really hard for them. Um, I've gone over this. So I wanna highlight a project that happened last year, um, the two fellows did, which was um, Irene, Nora, and also David, and that they basically idealized, I don't know if you use Grammarly, which basically, it's, it's a great tool that corrects your grammar in English. Um, it gives you potential mistakes that you have done, not only on spelling mistakes, but on phrasing, and so on and so forth. So they basically created this concept where, um, as you were surfing the internet, you could model your behavior towards your own biases to have more of like, um, a gender balanced attitude. And not with the idea that this is important for hiring, for the way you behave outside, but also with the idea of fixing this problem. And you know, this is a really bold idea, but I wanna tell you two things. The first one is that um, Irene, who is here today, got a full ride scholarship from La Casha to pursue her masters um, in the US, that she hasn't picked a university yet. And Irene went to work for Google Ireland. So those things are definitely valued. And how can we know that they're valued? Well, because Google implemented the very same project um, with the Google Translate. And I'm gonna say, 
probably um, the implementation was not the same, but the proof of concept, the idea, is something that you can pursue over the course of 12 Saturdays. And I also want to give you a little bit of perspective of myself, because people um, already ask me, oh, you know everything about AI, and I feel like such a cheat, because I still don't know everything, I will never do, um, and one year ago, I had no freaking idea about what AI was. I kid you not. Um, the way we began AI Saturdays is I was really, really passionate to learn. I signed up with Sergi, there was Miguel, they wanted to do this project. I said, let's do it. And we learned the lessons one week before we taught them, and we managed to do it. Um, so it's really about firing, uh, uh, finding one uh, ring to rule them all. Uh, in my case, um, through hackathons, it was a, a really, really good idea to go in them feeling like I should learn better and do better. And basically, uh, if you want to have an idea of how one year of self-development in AI Saturdays looks like, is um, I began AI Saturdays, I began learning online, I then realized that I was spending most of my time at my job thinking about AI and other things that I could do and not happy about my job, so I quit my job. I got accepted to the Masters of AI, so I realized, shit, I don't know how to code, so I'm gonna have to figure out a way how to do it. I went and did a coding bootcamp over the summer, and then I signed up for the Masters. It's definitely been the hardest semester of my life, because not only they expect us to code perfectly on Python, which I'm below the average level, but also they expect us to code the algorithms and so on and so forth. But I wanna just give you a shiny light of hope that you know I'm still here, you can see my my lack of sleep, but you know, I'm in presence and I'm looking forward to next week where I have finished all my exams and I've successfully passed the first semester. And if you wanna ask somebody else, we also have George, who decided to go on a journey to code 100 days in a row about AI. So I would say the biggest enemy that you have towards a self-learning journey is yourself, is your ability to filter every single distraction, to stop watching that YouTube video, to quit on Snapchat, um, to drop five hours of Instagram for one little focus time that we have. And if I can leave you one insight is this, is that, at least for me, I used to be a person that said yes to everything. I think I still say yes to 80% of the things, but you really need to learn when to say no. Because those things, if you're able to allocate some time for yourself, you're gonna be able to chase your own dreams. And the reality is that nobody else is gonna do it for you. And there's somebody else out there that is really, really trying to make the very thing happen that you want. And they're working hard. There are seven billion people in the world, at least one of them is working hard and has a similar profile than you. So my attitude when I approach this sort of things is, I wanna leave the smallest percentage possible to chance, you know? There's always one thing of you know somebody and they know somebody and they introduce you to one company, especially in Spain, which is a huge barrier for meritocracy. But um, that's, that's still, I would push you to reduce the odds and make sure that whatever you can do is possible. If you want some resources, um, feel free to take a picture, but there's basically two approaches of how you can learn AI. There's the unsupervised and the supervised approach, which is basically, if you, if you have no idea about programming at all, there's a fantastic course by Harvard, it's called CS50X. They start by C, which is one of the oldest language of programming, and they take it all the way down to Python. There's fast.ai, which we do in AI Saturdays. There's deep learning from Andrew and G and you can obviously come to AI Saturdays, and then there's more expensive approaches, such as the Udacity Nano degree, the MIT degree, which is accessible to anybody that has 3.5K, and you can do a master's coding bootcamp, and so on and so forth. Um, so thank you, I don't wanna steal any more of your time, and I wanna give the floor to the people in which we're actually here for, which is the ones that sacrificed 12 of their Saturdays which was, I kid you not, a really hard task to code and develop AI projects from scratch. <clears throat> so this is the schedule that we have. So if we could first have the handwriting recognition project show up on the stage, we'll give you guys the floor. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, one more thing is um, we're slightly behind on the timing. So we're gonna do one trick, right? Um, we're gonna give them 10 minutes, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set a timer for those 10 minutes. So when that timer rings, I want you to cloud, uh, clap 
as loud as possible, as if they had done an amazing job, even if they can, they haven't, because they have been 12 Saturdays there, and this is at the end the culmination of 10 minutes that they have to show, so I hope you can forgive a little margin error, but just clap as loud as you can, and we get one question, and then we move on to the next project. All right. Examples in many all the fields, all the sectors. Uh, for example, we can see or create a digital libraries from our own uh, notebooks, handwriting notebooks, and we can also uh, digitize uh, several documents such as legal docs, uh, hospital records, and banking check. This will not only um, make easier the storage uh, task, but also it will improve the, the accessibility to these documents and many other things. Uh, from a general perspective, the field of collective recognition can be divided into groups, the printed one and the handwritten. The first one is probably the most known, and we can find uh, several good examples from the well-known OCR system. In the second group, the handwritten can be further divided into online, that is when we make the character recognition as we write, and then the offline, that is when we use a picture from a test. And this is the approach that we use in our project. In terms of uh, accuracy, we achieve the state of the art 99% accuracy for the smaller data set with 10 classes, and 92% of accuracy with 47 classes. In this case, we 